Hey, Kyle, welcome back to the show today. Hey, Michael, thanks for having me back on. Appreciate it. Yeah, so we had you on a little while back in episode 172, which uh, was light years ago, and uh, it wasn't that long ago. It was maybe 18, 24 months, I can't remember. But so much has happened uh, since then, and, you know, we've seen you, you know, we, we got in touch with you when you first uh, joined our mentoring program, and, and you have come a long way very quickly, which is one thing I love about this business. But give us a little bit of background. I think people want to really get into how, you know, what your background was and, and um, you know, how you did your first deal how you quit your job you guys listen to episode 172 we're going to pivot on to some other stuff we're going to talk about uh asset management and scaling a portfolio because that's what kyle has really done today but give us a little, little background on yourself kyle yeah i started investing in real estate in 2010 mainly as a side gig while i had my full-time job i was in the golf business i was a regional director uh, for a golf management company so property management but for golf courses <laughs> And uh, I never thought I would leave that job. But in 2014, 15, I really started getting burned out, started looking at my 401k, which was very, very little and thought, you know what, I think I should probably go do something for myself. I had built up a skill set through the golf industry um, to do that myself. And so I really wanted to get into business for myself. I just happened to stumble across your course uh, in December of 2017. I took it with my wife, finished it in a couple of weeks. Uh, we, I mean, we just spent hours and hours on there. And uh, 11 months later, I left my full-time job to pursue this uh, before I even got a deal. But I just knew I, this is what I wanted to be in. And I, I really love the business and the business model. It really spoke to me. And uh, that's a wrap. Well, give us a little bit of a timeline. I know you quit your job before you had your first deal, but you didn't quit without uh, reason to do that. Uh, tell us a little bit of the timeline uh, and the kind of deal sizes that you, that you did and kind of over what time period. Yeah. So right, right when I started taking your course, I just jumped right in with everything. And so I started building an investor database. I started sending out monthly newsletters. And then three months later, I started a meetup. And then four months later, I started a podcast. And all during that time, I had picked my market. I had gone out to the market, talked to brokers, underwritten a ton of deals, made a bunch of offers. And then by the time I was ready to quit my job, I knew it was only a matter of time until we got our first deal. And being a lead sponsor, I really do believe you should do it full time. You're, you know, you're a fiduciary to your investors capital. Um, and so I left my job. And then two months later after that, January 2018, or 19, 19, I got my first deal under contract, closed that in May of 2019. And that was a 42 unit property, you know, nice little uh, property for a first deal. And uh, just like you say, art of the first deal, uh, three weeks later, we got a 128 unit, $15 million property that we ended up closing on a couple months after that. So yeah, that's, that's amazing. And, and now you have, what do you have under management right now? You've grown a considerable uh, We just time. sold our first one. So it was around 440. We're down to 400 right now. Wow. That's right. So you, did you sell that first one? We did. Yeah. After 23 months, we sold it. So full cycle on that in 23 months. Oh my gosh. That was, that is fantastic to kind of see that. Now, a lot of times we talk about, especially in the house flipping days, you talk about, you know, you, you make money when you, when you buy. And that may be true for house flipping, uh, but I don't think it's true for apartment buildings. And and, and the reason I, th I say that is because yes, you do you have to buy right, but if you don't execute on the on the actual plan, then you're not going to make money. And, and this is something that we underestimated, you know, early early on because you know we all love love the art of the deal. We love hunting for deals. You know, Garrett loves hunting for deals. You know, we love raising money, right? And then we close it, and we're done, right? We're done, and then we move on to the next deal, and we raise more money, and and all of a sudden we're looking back at kind of the mess we made behind us we're like well who's gonna manage all this stuff well i don't know you just we just made money when we bought right and like we, we realize that we're not focusing on the operations and the asset management and then the construction management now that that has all changed several months ago where we, Wait, you know, we have michael a, what hold on you don't just flip it over the fence and and to the man, management company and it works well, that's yeah, not how it works I, I, yeah i mean you know back in the old days that's what we thought you know we that's exactly right we flip it over the <laughs> management company and, and maybe you can do that with a smaller property and maybe you can do it with one or two properties but you know and this is what i want to talk to you about kyle because you've experienced kind of high growth like like you have and you've come to similar conclusions so i want to shine a light on on all this stuff on the asset management the operations part of it but a lot of times we get confused like we did and garrett just brought it up about the the differences between property management and asset management right because early on we're like well the property manager runs everything and i just gotta you know watch our kpis and you know and make sure they're doing a good job and that was the extent of asset management so Kyle, what is kind of the difference in your mind between property management and asset management? 
Yeah, I mean, as the asset manager, we manage our own assets, right? So we're also the owner operator, but essentially an asset manager is the person that's gonna hold the property management company accountable. You're buying a multi-million dollar business. So if you're gonna hand the keys to a multi-million dollar business, millions of dollars of investor capital, to a property management company who's making 3% on the top line, that's a big mistake, right? Number one, they don't really know what your full business plan is. They don't know which way you want to pivot based on your investors' needs, all those different things. So you need to be setting systems up in advance in order to help manage them and really partner with them. I mean, an asset manager is also another partner in helping get the best out of the property. Um, and so they work side by side next to the property manager in, in essence, but also hold them accountable. Yes, they're holding it accountable. But Garrett, I mean, you remember this where, you know, where we're like, man, do, do, we thought that asset management was was just, you know, really just looking at the reports and holding them accountable. When, when we first brought on an asset manager and we started interviewing asset managers, we discovered that the average asset manager was very hands on. Like, Garrett, talk about that. It, it shocked us. We're like, holy cow, they do way more than, you know, a bunch of bunch of reports. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, the asset management side of it, I mean, it's, it has to be hands on. It's the property manager. They only get, like Kyle said, they only get so much of the picture, the full picture of what you're actually doing. And so, you know, the asset manager has to be, have their hands kind of in everything and, and they're monitoring their, you know, the, the reporting of, of the property manager. They're, they're going in and getting in the weeds and a lot of stuff. And then they're doing site visits on top of it. It's another system of checks and balances that is absolutely necessary in order to make these businesses run at an optimal level and hit the returns that you project to your investors often enough. And so I, I love Kyle that you've kind of, Brooke, you came, came out here and you're like, listen, I'm going to talk about the side of the business that no one's really talking about because it's not the sexy side of the business. Let's be honest. Everybody, the sexy side is uh, raising the money and finding the deals. Okay. And then, then there's the in-between, which is, Hey, actually we have to make this thing work. And a property manager alone is not going to do that for you. And so Kyle, what made you kind of pivot into this arena? versus the not going you didn't you didn't go with everyone else and into the sexy side of it like the capital side and the deal side why did you get here yeah uh, here? i kind of like the boring side to be honest which is you know one way <laughs> or another but that was my background in management operations of a golf course like i said i was a, a regional director for a golf management company so i was doing those things i was the one implementing systems holding my teams accountable hiring firing all those different things and so that's where i really was like doing for the last 20 years. So I naturally gravitated towards that on the, on the apartment side. And really, I just saw this huge gap in just education on, on that side of it and people understanding that this is really a multi-million dollar business that you're handling. But I don't know, I'm just passionate about the management operation side. I just love it. So I just gravitated towards it. Well, then you only gravitated, but you recently moved into your target market. I remember when when we were first signed on, you were, you you spent like eight hours driving. Where were you before? Like, what what state were you in? You were not in yeah, Phoenix. Yeah, southern Southern California, yeah. and we would drive to Tucson or Phoenix, which That's is right. a five yeah. or eight hour drive. Yep. That's right. So you actually moved there recently. Why did you do that? Just to be boots on the ground, you know. I there's another investor out in um, in Arizona. Garrett knows him, and he's taking down deals left and right, off market left and right. And it's <laughs> you know, and he says it's because he's boots on the ground. You know, he's yeah. but he's able to build these relationships with people. And can you do it from another state? Hundred percent. But it takes a lot more effort. And you know, if you can invest in your backyard, you can grow your portfolio better. You can grow your relationships better. You can grow your understanding of the market better. And so, you know, the only reason why we moved here was to grow our portfolio. Yeah, that's right. Let's talk about, about some of the best practices that you guys use when you're asset managing. What are some of those things that you're using to really hold your property manager accountable to get the most out of these properties? Yeah, uh, aside from KPIs, one thing that we do is I call it a secret shopper scorecard uh, or secret shopper audit. This is something that I took from the golf business. And what we were doing there, what happened at the golf business is they would hire a company, they would visit the golf course, they would go sit down in the restaurant, rate their experience, make sure they got a receipt, make sure they got served on time and then go hit balls on the 
golf range, same thing. And so we do the same thing with a, uh, with a, a shopper report where we'll call in. We want to make sure they're answering the phone call. We want to make sure they're getting back to us after we leave a message same day, if not within an hour. Uh, and then we'll do an online inquiry as well. So we do this once a month. And uh, on that online inquiry, we track how long it takes them to get back to us. If the email was professional, did they actually call us as well? Cause we want a phone call, then an email was their follow-up. So we've got an 80 point system where they get graded and then we send them the scorecard and have a training moment uh, on a monthly basis basis on that. And, uh, you know, we want to see 90% or better. And there definitely is a fine line between micromanagement and um, asset management. But at the same time, you use these tools to make the team better, understand the systems that you want in place, and then they get better. And essentially, you know, the property improves as well. What are you using for those secret shops? Are you doing yourself? Did you hire a company? Is it kind of a, a mix? Yeah, we have an assistant that does it. So she just has it on her calendar to do it every uh, every single month for every property. And we just have a different tab every month for those. And we also, when we're doing the online platform, we'll make sure we do it on a different platform every time. So apartments.com, website, apartment guide. And that way, while she's doing that, she's also checking the listing to make sure it's up to date. It looks professional and clean. If there's any type of uh, reviews on that, there were negative, we'll go ahead and tackle those as well. So there's also reputation management that's involved in that. So it's a great use of an assistant, by the way, on, on, on a side note there. But that, weren't your leasing managers figuring out that it's your assistant uh, who's contacting them every single time? <laughs> How do you prevent that from happening? Yep. So what we do is for the phone calls, we use a Google voice number and you can change that every month. And so we'll do that. And then the online inquiry, we build a brand new Gmail account every single month. It just takes two minutes. And yeah, you can't have the same message. You can't have it from the same email or else it'll go in the pipeline as that. And every time we ask a very specific question, whether it's, hey, do you have any top floor available? I want to live on the top floor. Hey, I'm living with my mom. She needs a bottom floor. Hey, do you accept dogs? And what we want to see is that they're not just copying and pasting our, our template in there. They, they are answering the, you know, the potential resident directly on on the questions that they're asking, they're engaging, they're adding value to that resident. Yeah. So, so you jump in, all right, you, you do the secret shopping. That's, that's great. That's one thing. What are the ways are you auditing your properties using asset management? And then when you do that, how do you actually make the change on site if the PM is running it? Yeah. So the other thing we do is we have a KPI dashboard with about 40, 50 different KPIs that come through. One thing we really focus on is the marketing side of it, how many leads are coming through and the conversion ratios in between each. Neil Bawa talks a lot about it. It's called LASL. Uh, other things we do is look at lease trade outs, making sure that the lease that is just um, come due and being replaced is more than the previous one before. And so we take our property management company through these KPIs. We'll show them the dashboard. We'll show them the KPIs and say, hey, look at these situations. And really it's more mindset than anything, right? Every situation is gonna be different, but you want the mindset to empower your property management company to just say, to not just say, hey, the market rates are 900. That's what I'm selling this unit for. Well, let's look at a couple other variables. What's the demand, you know, is this uh, unit, uh, was it rented for more last time? Was there a reason for that? And there's LRO systems and, and automation systems that um, are, are very helpful nowadays, but a lot of beginning investors can't afford some of these tools. And so you need to be able to know how to ask the right questions and utilize those KPIs without those tools as well. Do you have your property managers do rental comps or do you do them yourself or how do you, because you talked about it. Well, how do you know you're getting the most for this? How, what about for this amenity, that many, this room, upper room? How are you guys handling that? Yeah, so we do both. We do a, a monthly uh, rental comp from our property management company that they send us, and then we'll have our assistant cross-reference it. So we, she doesn't do the comps herself, but she'll double check it. Mm. One thing we also would suggest is doing a check on rubs. Rubs is a big thing in Arizona. Some markets don't have them, but always comp out your rubs too. It's not something that you would think that you would comp out, but we were only charging 50 bucks and the whole market was charging 65. So we immediately got a $15 lift just on our rubs by just looking around at the local market. So definitely make sure you're calming out your rubs as well. And that's huge, by the way. People, when you're in this business, every dollar is just such, mm. has such an exponential impact on the value of the property. So going in and changing something just like your other income, like even picking that up, even $15 oh, yeah. makes a big difference on, on where you can even sell the property for later. So that's amazing you that you go and check the rubs too. I think, uh, I don't think a lot of people probably do that. What other stuff are you, are you doing, Kyle? 
pet rent as, as well. But one thing we actually just started using on the rub side is a, a third party service called Conservice. And uh, what they do is, is this is more for master meter properties, but you can do it on, on individually metered, but you can capture up to 90 to 95% of your utility bill. And so where we were once getting 50 to 65, we're now getting $125 a unit for these rubs when we were originally budgeted about half that. And that's by just billing back the resident. And originally we thought, man, is that too much of a lift, which you got to be careful of, but the way it's pitched to the investors is, or the, the residents is, look, you're just paying for your utilities. It's just a straight pass through to you. They don't know that their bill is going to be higher or lower. They just know that the less energy that they use, the lesser electrical bill is going to be. So that's been a huge value add for us. I got, I got one. I just thought of one. Uh, so, <laughs> so step further, one, one step further on top of that. So we'll actually go in and do low flow toilets, water conservation bill a hundred percent. Okay. And then we'll tack on, on the renewals, a, an amenity fee or something to help bridge that gap even further, turn that mm -hmm. into additional income. Because if you think they are already paying more uh, before prior on that, even if they were at 80 or 90% of their rubs income, they were likely paying more on that water bill when they had a higher water bill. Right. So you lower the water bill and then tack on on top of it to kind of bridge a gap and then add even more income. So you just made me think of that, Kyle. That's yep. that's something that we I agree do. with that strategy. hundred percent. What else do you, cool. what else do you do from an asset management perspective? perspective? Yeah. From another income perspective, we looked at um, the storage containers, the package lockers. The one thing I would say there is be careful because we're tacking on all these income items right now. Right. And we're saying, Oh, we can get 15 here or 20 here you need to make sure that that doesn't affect the rents. Cause if you buy package lockers for 20 grand, you raise it up $14, but essentially you can't raise your rents $14. You just spent 20 grand for no reason. Now package lockers have a great benefit. So the office doesn't have to manage the package. And there's some other things there, but you always got to make sure that the market can handle all these increases, all these increases at once, or else you're paying for things that you think you're getting added value on when you're really not. Cause it affects the total rent. Well, the problem is you can't you can't charge for everything. Some of these things are intangibles, like what's the value of a pool or a rec center or this that. And the same thing, package lockers, right? So it's sometimes difficult to put a dollar figure on it, right? But you know, two things being equal, something as a packet locker is going to be it superior to one that doesn't. So sometimes it's hard to put you know, to actually directly monetize it. Um, but but looking for stuff like even like the of you know tr trash valet, like stuff like that. Not every property can 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 you can utilize that but some you can i was gonna you read my mind michael actually because i, I was just do. thinking i'm like i'm like <laughs> kyle what do you think about valet trash because this is a little bit of a it, it adds additional stress to your property it can also add additional income and it is a pretty good amenity but it depends so i would love to hear your thoughts on that one yeah, we're more in the class C space. So you're not going to see a lot of that. There's just something that you, that you can't um, charge for. Uh, you know, if you want to separate yourself from your competition during a difficult time where the competition's high, maybe you add it, but it is quite expensive for the property to take on that expense. But again, in a class C area, I think it's an ex expense you're going to have to take on. I don't think you can raise the rents 25 bucks and still get the annual increases that you want. What about construction? Yeah. Uh, construction is something that we under underestimated also. Well, the property manager will handle that. They'll turn the units. Well, yeah, that may be uh, the case on a, on a light value add deal. But when you're trying to turn 10, 15, whatever plus, you know, per month. And again, you can do it on one property, but you got two or three properties at the same time. All of a sudden, the level of complexity starts going up. How do you guys, uh, how are you, is that a challenge for you right now? And if so, how are you handling that? Yeah, renovation management is always a challenge for sure. I think it's one of the biggest challenges in the industry and uh, we're always trying to get better at it. We are lucky in the sense that we use a property management company that has an in-house GC and an in-house rehab team. Mm -hmm. That does not mean that they're perfect or easy to manage, but at least everything's under one umbrella. But what we do is we use Trello to track the renovation management. And it's a very easy, easy tool. And it's just everyone's invited to this board, everyone on our team, everyone on the managers on site team, our regional, and then our, and our general contractor. And they are in charge of putting all the units that are currently, you know, vacant and then move them to the rehab phase. And then there are several phases in between in the rehab phase. And then once it gets signed off, it gets to the done section. And in there, there's also notes. So what was the previous rent? What's the current rent? What was the cost of the renovation? What was the move-in date? 
What was the actual move in date? You know, how long did it take for the renovation to, to handle? And we want to see 21 days or less. And so, and then on a turn five days or less. So uh, that's how we manage it now. It's not a perfect system, but at least everyone's trained and involved on it. And it's a live working document. So at any point I could pull it up right now and say, Hey, what's going on with this unit here? It's, it's behind. To go along with that, how are you managing that alongside the material shortages that are happening right now in the market? Because I know that's on everyone's mind and I know everybody's dealing with it in their own way. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, definitely been a challenge. And when it first hit, we had delays in our in our renovations. They went up to even 40 days to finish, which is just unacceptable. But what we've done is we've gotten an additional storage unit, put it at the property and we'll we'll order 20 appliance packages at once or 20 cabinets at once. And along with that, you can actually negotiate pricing discounts too, because you're buying in bulk. Um, so that's what we've been able to do on the items that have been hard to get. And uh, it's helped us. And so we'll order 20 at a time. And once we're through about 10 or 12 renovations, we'll order another set. They just can't get stolen then, right? Yeah. So that's, that is a big one. So we've, we've actually used a down unit or a unit uh, for a short period of time. Don't suggest that obviously it takes a revenue unit offline, but that was our only option at that property. Uh, and then we, or we had a woodshed and that woodshed we get broken in pretty easily. So we get one of those mobile minis and just have, you know, several locks on it to make sure it's as secure as possible. Yeah, I think this is the true impact of COVID. Like we always thought it was collections, you know, eviction more term. I think the real impact is is the impact on construction. I am I'm 100% convinced of it because there's two issues. Number one is getting supplies. Uh, I, I mean, yes, they're higher, but the biggest problem is getting them, actually getting them, doors, windows, whatever. And then number two, getting the labor. I had a conversation yeah. with our construction manager, Jeff, yesterday. That's his numbers. And I see it on my own house. Trying to get someone to show up and fix something or do something is impossible. And they all tell me the same thing. They can't get anyone to show up to do work. And why is this, ladies and gentlemen? It's because our government is making it much more lucrative to sit on a home on their butt, not doing anything than showing up for work. And this is a real big problem. And it's affecting... Uh, the multifamily value add business significantly. And therefore, as a result, it takes 40 days to return a unit, which is unacceptable because now you can't, if you can't turn a unit, you can't, uh, you don't, you can't get a lease, you can't get rent in. And that really is a true impact. So finding, getting the supplies like you're doing, buying in bulk, working with vendors that have the capacity to, to, to do this kind of work. Um, now, we think that this is probably going to resolve itself probably in two or three months or so. I mean, I'm thinking based on it, right? Uh, but that, that to me is a, is a big impact of COVID on the business. And also, I mean, one other remedy to this that, that I think everyone should pay attention to is having a deep roster of vendors because mm -hmm. what I'm also, what I'm seeing now are vendors that were good for a long period of time. And all of a sudden they're just not showing up to the job site. Um, I'm banging down the door of the pool guy. I'm like, Hey, where's, why are there not people on site for, you know, a week or two and they were supposed to be there every day. And so, so having someone else that you could call to jump in, I mean, at the end of the day, you got to get the stuff done regardless. You can't, you can't just wait around. And so with, with there being some uncertainty around the labor crews and some of these vendors are having issues behind the scenes, you got to have a deep roster so that you can make the pivots necessary to get the job done on time. And so one of the challenges is, and we all have this, and the advantage is that we're working with third-party property managers, and that's great because we don't have to create our own property management company necessarily. But the problem is we don't control everything, right? So we're getting back to the accountability thing, Kyle. And I don't know, um, you know, how do you, I, it's not so much how do you hold them accountable. It's easy to hold someone accountable. What do you do or what can you do when they're not performing? I don't know if you've had that before, right? But how do you deal with, hey, you know, you're falling short here, you're falling short here. How do you handle that situation? Yeah, they're not easy conversations, but luckily with our property management company, we've got a direct line to the owner and we've had to call on the owner sometimes. And we've actually switched out a regional manager because of a uh, bad performance or someone that we just didn't feel was a good fit. And I think having the relationships with the right people will allow you to do that. Now, did things get better? Yes. Do they always get better? No. You know, as far as holding the renovation team accountable, it's just having them on the weekly call, talking through it, kind of putting the ball on their court saying, look, what, what is it that is causing this issue? And if they don't have an answer, then obviously, you know, it, it's time to move on from them. So we've looked at 
uh, having a deeper bench in our renovation team and actually subbing out some things that are just not getting done in time. And then also, you know, calling back to the owner and saying, Hey, what are some things that we can do to help fix this in order to get it done? And it doesn't happen overnight, but that's what asset managers about is identifying bottlenecks and kind of tackling them, tackling them, tackling them until you have an efficient system. Kyle, this is great information. Um, you, you actually came out with a book recently, or it's, it's about to launch. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Tell, on June 29th. Tell us about that. Yeah. On June 29th, we launched a book. It's called best in class and it's all about asset management. So, uh, anything from due diligence and investor relations, marketing and leasing disposition, even to down to the tools that we use. Uh, and then we have some online resources for them to go to as well. So you can pick that up the eBooks, uh, on Amazon for 99 cents and it's called uh, best in class. Yeah, I, I love that. I think I think it really shines a light on how important asset management is. And it's much more hands on than people might think. So when you're doing your secret shopper, that's pretty hands on, right? If you're doing site visits is pretty hands on, you get involved with construction it's pretty hands on. And so I think the lesson here is, is that asset management is, is more of a hands on sport than something simply number crunching in a spreadsheet. I mean, what advice do you have for the, you know, um, for someone who is now starting to grow their portfolio, they've maybe done a deal, maybe three, right? Because in, in the beginning, asset management is less important when you have your first deal, you're so excited. You know, the law of the first deal brings a second deal. And then all of a sudden, after like the third deal, you're like, crap, I got a, I got a little bit of an operational issue here. You know, how can be people be a little more proactive versus, you know, more reactive than, than necessarily, oh my gosh, I have a problem. Let me try to solve it. What are some of your advice on around asset management? Yeah, I mean, in a perfect scenario, you have a partner or a team member that has operations and management experience. You don't necessarily have to have asset management experience for an apartment. Like I came from the golf business, right? And a lot of the things that I did in the golf business relate to the apartment business because they're both running businesses. But you really want to have someone on your team that has that. If not, I mean, look, reach out to the industry. This industry is fantastic when it comes to getting resources and education. Um, reach out to people and ask them. I mean, during COVID, it was probably the most amazing time to see all the webinars two, three times a day about what everyone was facing the challenges, the things they were doing to help each other because no one had gone through it before. And so we got a ton of information by just attending those types of things. So just get out there and ask other people, ask your peers, ask people who are already doing it. Yeah. All right. It's very good. So you want to have a team member on board. What about the difference between partnering and, um, and hiring someone? Like, what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I think it just depends on what your overall goals are, three, five, 10 year goals and how big you want to scale. You certainly don't have to have a full time partner. When I say someone on your team, it could be someone that you hire, but you don't want to hire someone that you have to train essentially to be able to do these things. You do want to have someone that has some type of management and operations experience because mm -hmm. there's a lot of things there's it gets into the detail. Like we said, it's very hands on. So some to see, teach someone like that, to teach someone about attention to detail, they have to be a certain type of personality. We like doing disc assessments and looking for a certain type of personality and character traits that would fit within that role to help us find the right person. It's a lot of it is blocking and tackling as things come in, right? So if you have, to, like you said, Kyle, if you have to find someone that is new to the business, doesn't understand what they're doing necessarily, that's going to pause. That's going to have a big issue and impact on your business because they're going to be getting hit in the face with different tasks that need to get done. And you got to have someone that's already ready for that. And so there's what you find is like you, like you said, also Kyle's you get into the business, people get in, they get their first or second apartment complex. Maybe they can't afford like a full-time hundred percent dedicated asset manager out the gate that's experienced. Um, and so they have to find the resources. So, you know, we've, there's, there's sometimes there's companies out there that are, are doing it third party. I think there's less of those um, that exist. So there, there just has to be that, like you said, that gap between, okay, we're figuring this out. Maybe there's other people that, that are in the business that we can lean on. To, to actually move forward on this stuff. But this is why in an early phase, you, you end up uh, you know, partnering. You're giving away equity because you can't afford to pay someone, right? And then as you grow scale, uh, as, you, as you sort of scale and your asset management fees get larger, you have the ability now to pay a $75,000 salary. And so things change over, 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 over time. So that's really the, the you know, that's really the, the, the issue is how do you get that person? And I think in the beginning, you're probably thinking more like what partner can I bring on or the person you're partnering with 
do they have an operational managerial bent, right? Because there's, there's really three, actually four roles in a syndication. One is the deal finding. Number two is the capital raising. Number three is the operations. We're talking about that now. And then number four, eventually, and you're already starting to do it, is the marketing, right? The, the podcast, the blogs, the video, the, the book, right? And all four of those become more relevant as the a portfolio scales. And the question is, how do you satisfy those roles uh, moving up? So... Well, this has been great, Kyle. I, I love this focus on asset management. Like, like Garrett said, you don't really love to talk about it because it's just kind of so boring and it takes so long, <laughs> you know, to move this, to, to turn the ship. But uh, I love your focus on asset management, Kyle. I love that. It's, it's definitely needed in the space. How can people find out more about you and, and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. If you go to assetmanagementmastery.com, that's a great place to go. It's got all of our resources, our book, everything else that has to do with asset management as well. So I appreciate you guys having me on. All right, Asset Management Mastery as well. And then check out your book, Best in Class. So Kyle, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.